Before Larry went to High Tech High and created that as a founding principle, he worked 11 years working with inner city students, motivating them, creating three documentary films about the work that he and his colleagues were doing. Let's give a round of applause for Larry Rosenstock. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, clarification. Uh, I did make documentary films for PBS. One of them closed a prison, and instead of realizing the power of film, I decided to go to law school. Single, unmarried dad in law school of my now 39-year-old, who I'll see tomorrow, tattoo artist for Major League Baseball. And, uh, and I then uh, uh, worked as a carpenter in law school, did not attend classes, study groups, the efficacy of study groups for kids. You don't need to, you don't need to do it if you do a study group. Then I taught uh, carpentry at the height of DSEG in the Boston School to working class kids for 11 years. And the first day of teaching those kids, I realized, Betty, these kids are every bit as bright as middle class kids I was just in law school with. How come these kids are over here, those kids are over there? High Tech High uh, came out of a, a, a several efforts, but basically, uh, sadly, we had 8,600 kids in the lottery uh, last month for 300 openings. We use a zip code based lottery. Brown versus Board is still good law. Uh, Meredith case, if you know it, uh, where the Supreme Court shot down DSEG in St. Louis and Seattle, but Kennedy concurred with the majority and said geographically based plans are okay, so we're still cool. Basically, every zip code, whatever percent of kids reside in every zip code is the percent of kids who reside in our schools, K through 12, uh, 11 schools in the San Diego area, Chula Vista, San Marcos, and, and San Diego. We have 100% of our kids take the A through G courses ever since we've opened for Cal State UC admissions. We uh, have no segregation of kids as a cohort model once they get there. Uh, just in terms of data, 74% uh, of our free and reduced lunch kids have graduated for, from a four-year college. 100%, 99% of our kids have gone to college. Um, and uh, it's very much focused on, on college. I just want to show you, that's enough for me. I just want to show you uh, work of students, okay? And let, as uh, somebody, Jack Nicholson, I heard, had a nervous actor on the stage with him in the act, and Jack Nicholson said, don't be nervous, let the costume do the acting. I'm not nervous, but I want the costume to do the acting. Uh, this is a new school that uh, we just built in Chula Vista. Uh, the elementary is uh, on the left and behind it on the right uh, up there is the middle and the right. You see a little tip of the high school down there in the corner. The mountains are Mexico. A friend of mine said, wow, you should find a way for the kids from Mexico to get into the school. I said, they already have. <laughs> Calculicious, integration of art and calculus, which happened to be an exhibit. Art, you know, math, we thought that math was going to integrate with science better than it actually did uh, with art. Uh, it very much integrates with art, and you'll see a fair bit of that. Our teachers work collegially and in groups. This is, uh, uh, was on display at the airport. This is an original that I have in my office from Calculicious. It's all work done by students. We had a, the president of the uh, University of Chicago was there last spring, and he looked at Calculicious, and he said to the teacher, uh, biophysics, uh, a, 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 a art teacher, and a guy with a PhD in astrophysics from Oxford, a Scottish guy. And he said, well, this is all well and good, but what about the standards? So they went in their room and said, the standards. And then the next project they did was to have the seniors illustrate the California State Newtonian physics standards uh, for freshmen, OK, and created a book. We've created about 80 books using Blurb and Lulu. All you have to do is you know, send the PDF. Uh, uh, Economics Illustrated, a uh, former TFA or whom we hired, he's a 10th grade teacher, and he uh, did a book on, on terms from microeconomics that we frequently know, such as you know, warm glow preferences, externalities, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and there was a CEO I gave a copy to, of this book to, and um, he was talking to uh, Bill Clinton recently, and he, Bill Clinton told him on the phone, he said, I've really gotten into microeconomics. And the CEO said, that's interesting. I just read a book that helped me understand it better than anything I ever read before. And Bill said, really, who wrote it? And he said, some 10th graders at a school called High Tech High. So he asked me for a copy. So I sent him a few uh, and with a little post-it that said, in case you know any former presidents that want to brush up on their microeconomics. Um, <laughs> Public exhibition, very important. Observation, reflection, documentation of ex and exhibition. Public exhibition, when, when this, is, this is all about another way of the, the, the two assessments that we care about are was something I developed with my dear friend and colleague, Ted Sizer, for any school, our school, a country, a state, 
A, of your entering ninth graders in your school district, what percent graduated from a four-year college? B, of your entering kids in free or reduced lunch who entered your ninth grade, what percent graduated from a four-year college? C, what percent of A was B? That tells you more about a school, that I think, than anything else. And we love, that's our numbers, and that's what we go by. OK, so observation, reflection, documentation, exhibition. When we have exhibition nights, there are thousands of parents, grandparents, nephews, nieces, everyone packing the schools. We didn't tell them to come. The kids did. This is, they're working on an ornithopter, uh, Michelangelo's uh, ornithopter uh, right there. Uh, analog flash for windows, a very cool project. We have these little, uh, for fire rating, these little windows that are two feet by two feet. Seniors, uh, 20, 50 seniors, two to a group, each had to do a permanent installation that demonstrated a physics concept and you can see this on everything I'm showing you is online. And in order, if uh, Mark and I were a team, we would have to set up a study group with each of the 24 other teams. And the final exam is there. It's a very rigorous final exam. In order to pass the final exam, the only way you could do it is if you understood the physics from all 25 exhibitions. Um, this is our design principles, everything again online. This is a Picasso piece. We do a lot of stuff on art. And of course, STEAM, as someone said earlier, is ap absolutely apropos. By the way, uh, just coincidentally, 17% of the undergrads in the United States major in science, and tech technology, engineering, and math. 38% of our graduates uh, major in science, technology, engineering, and math. I think it's because they're doing it. They're, they're behaving like a mathematician. They're behaving like a biologist. That's also why, like E.O. Wilson, who we work with, and Jane Goodall, whom we work with, uh, we don't do AP. And the reason we don't do AP is because a lot of people are feeling that AP is a disincentive for wanting to be a biologist because you get misled to think that biologists memorize 2,000 words instead of doing field work and actually doing science. Power lunch, we have power lunches. People come in from outside, talk about their work. All of our kids do internship in the public and private sector. Obviously, lots of blogging, public service advertising campaign. Uh, we do a lot cross-border stuff, needless to say, given who we are. We're, we're minutes from the most cross-border on the planet, and it is a major, a major feature. We stole uh, this land from Mexico in 1850. No one could say otherwise, and we need to uh, respect that. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if my students the only one who ever said it. I'm not here illegally. They just put the border on the other side of me. Um, <laughs> and science, yeah. Science, science fiction, uh, a great work of science fiction. Actually, that teacher went on to work with the Buck Institute. Writing on the walls, another, these are all, uh, we, we created a graduate school of education uh, where we credential our own teachers and we give master's degrees in school leadership and teacher leadership. And actually, with Cal Berkeley next year, we are jointly offering uh, free online grad school courses. And the class that I teach on Berkeley is not taught in any of the other 1,150 ed schools in the country. It's called New School Creation, How to Start a School. Authorization, law, facilities, et cetera. It's, I taught carpentry. I'm into all that kind of stuff. And what's the purpose? Every school needs to have a purpose. And I, there are several people here. We could go into a school and say to the principal, what's the, school, what's the school's purpose? They say, what do you mean? It's a school. And, but we could drive away. We could all talk about what its purpose was, whether they could articulate it or not. So you might as well have one, okay? And our purpose at core is social class integration first and foremost, and innovation in pedagogy, in pedagogy right on the heels of that. Uh, this, is a, this is a really cool thing uh, where they did math uh, to, uh, to, uh, as a graphing project, and you did Descartes. The Blood Bank Project, another great project that we did with the many hospitals around us and juniors on their internship. Uh, this is about, we work a lot with Ron Berger, whose name has aptly been mentioned several times today. Uh, we do a lot of work with the ocean and, and reflection on the ocean. We've published several books that are guides to San Diego Bay. Actually, that's how Jane Goodall came to us. She saw the book and said, can I write the intro to this book? And then I don't know how many people know E.O. Wilson, the octogenarian ant guy who I just come to know extremely well. And he emailed me and said, I see that Jane, that Jane Goodall is writing your, your stuff on this book. This is what I think science should be like. Can I please write the forward to your next book, and Jane said, of course. By the way, I asked, I interviewed him on, my, on our website, in his, in his lab at Harvard, and I asked him three questions. What is the moment in a great scientist like your own's life and others that you know that they realized and they got the instinct, I want to say got the bug, to be a scientist? And he said, childhood. 
all of us. It's, it's, it's in childhood that we had the, quote, eurekaizing moment where the whole world opens up to us. And my second question was, how are schools as presently organized places that give rise to those eurekaizing moments? He said, they don't. And the third question was about field work and, and uh, work out, out in the world, including the internet, uh, as he said, as work, like he's got EOL and LOE.org, encyclopediaoflife.org, and lifeonearth.org, publicly contributed wikis of different species. Great guy to work with. Uh, this is, you know, this is the, uh, uh, of the, the study of phi and, and how you get to see you know, the perfect uh, of beauty. And the kid picked poor Martin Feldman because his face uh, didn't quite cut it. And that was in Calculicious. Okay. Uh, Cruzando's Fronteras. So my mother is an, is a, is an immigrant from Italy. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I came over in 45 as a war bride. Employees, kids at high tech highs, kids get it automatically, which is a great blessing. Uh, my son went to high tech high. He's now at, at Berkeley majoring in physics and film. I asked him if that's because they both start with fuh. But, um, and my daughter is graduating this year. And she said, what are you going to do when I go to college? I said, move to that city. But anyway, she, she, uh, she, did, she did a great piece in here about my mom and, and, the, and the, the risk that we all take in crossing a border. And my mom now having dementia. And, and it was just precious how she wrote about that next border where she's actually been here since 45 and she has now forgotten her English and only speaks in Italian. Um, oh, another one. This is one of my advisees, wonderful young man who, as a freshman, made a book much like an Eric Carle book, you know, kids' books. This is, a, again, you can get it on blurb. It's a beautiful book in which he explained black holes for younger kids, for elementary and middle school kids. I'm a, I'm a very, very big fan. I've read all the Stephen Hawking stuff. I don't claim I understand all of it. I love this stuff. This is one of the best descriptions of black holes I've ever seen. The be it's like, like Charlie Mingus said, it's easy to make the simple complicated. True genius lies in making the complex simple. And when you let kids produce work, they can make the complex simple, which is why I just have to dedicate all of this to Anna, y Anna Yip today, because Anna, I'm going to be thinking about you for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep going. All right. Okay, yet another one, Philosopher Shines in the Night, Physics A to Z, yet another one. Again, our, our schools are an artifactorium of exhibited work all over the place, and it's always changing. Hidden Garden, a very involved project where they made films, they planted stuff. Those little lights down there at the bottom were actually stop-action motion they made of the plants that were growing next to them, which showed them growing uh, very quickly, so you got to see that. They put, put saran wrap around them so the water wouldn't wouldn't bother them. We do a lot of work around invasive species uh, and studying the water. That's the stuff I mentioned with, uh, uh, with Jane Goodall and uh, E.O. Wilson, ancient sailors and sea, sea, seafarers, uh, conceptual art. I'll just I go back to this one more time. We're dedicating this year to this teacher, Aaron. I'm wearing a little thing about Aaron. Aaron has a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I've got my little wristband right here. And he uh, got sick with uh, soft cell sarcoma. Uh, and was, was left us uh, about three months later. And um, the pain that I really feel for his two and four year old is they won't know who Aaron was. And we're doing everything that we can, like my saying this about who this guy was, a well-loved, uh, vibrant 39 year old teacher. Um, Okay, uh, this is kind of cool. This is, this is another thing about uh, a study of, of art um, and uh, algebra in this particular case. Um, oh, this is another great thing. So, you know, you're in a back hallway the other day, and we got this other new teacher. He's a Cal grad in physics, as a matter of fact. And, and it's, just, it's just quietly exhibited. He's got, what are seniors doing? They're like thinking about, you know, it's like Eric Erickson said in that stage of man, who, who, identity uh, and industry. Who am I and how do I contribute to the world? So seniors are going through a lot. I mean, their 11th grade is the most measured year in any, any of our lives, right? And then they're applying to college and they're, and they're making these statements and they're making a resume. And so what this guy had on the wall, he asked every kid to make an infographic resume. And this is, this is Hunter's. And then, and then I said, put them, bookmark them, Book, do, do, do them like that, like a book, you know, and just make a book. Okay, great. These are graphics are basically showing uh, the border and the places where people cross and diners, et cetera, et cetera. Just a lot of mapping and, and math and integrating and art and making it plain, making it obvious, making it thrilling, making it fun and publicly exhibiting it always. 
And then uh, Dr. there's a public exhibition. And of course, Dr. Zeus, when I moved to San Diego, I said to my wife, all these, all these things look like Dr. Zeus trees. And I didn't realize that he lived there and they're representational trees. Tensegrity chair, uh, a tensegrity chair, which is very difficult to make. They printed a book on, on chairs called Get Bent. This is an installation outside of my office. Okay, here's paradox therapy is something that I live by. So I got an art teacher. He's brilliant. He's a nutcase. He comes in my office, says, because of the filters, he can't go on eBay. Go on eBay and buy a, buy a cigarette machine. I said, what? He said, shh. So I go, I got on there. He said, what are we buying a cigarette machine? He said, hurry up. So, I, so $200 cigarette machine, mid-century from Tennessee. The next thing I see at the front door near the school, the original High Tech High, is they've retooled the machine. They've taken out cigarettes and put in, buy a piece of High Tech High at the top and down at the bottom. You know, then, then they put in on balsa wood, they made cigarette packs, the same size and weight as cigarette packs in wood, made paintings. You can't see it, but on the right-hand side in engineering, they retooled the machine for credit cards. So you come in, you can buy a piece of High Tech High art. And I love when visitors come in and they said, There's, what is a cigarette machine doing here? That's the paradoxical part. And then they look at it and they go, Oh, that's the therapeutic part, okay? So um, I want to uh, just show you one video that's, that's two minutes long, and then I'll take 10 seconds after that and be done. This is a young man who had a, as challenging a life as anybody I have seen in my 35 years, and is the type of quiet student that you don't really hear from. And then he produced this two-minute video, and the consequence of that is that he is now in the linguistics program this year at UCSD. <laughs> for my last seconds, ever since the Texas State Board of Ed two years ago saw fit to take Thomas Jefferson out of the state standards, ergo the problem with content standards, I have committed myself for the next couple years to always mention something about Thomas Jefferson, who merely wrote the Declaration of Independence and founded the first non-sectarian university on the planet. Uh, but he said, uh, the purpose of public education isn't to serve the public. The purpose of public education is to create a public. And my grandmother, my Tanta Esther, who came from Eastern Europe in 1911 to New York City, who was five feet tall, and in 1930 was the first female taxi medallion owner and driver in New York City. And most of the, most of the brains in my family lineage came from her. She once said to me, Larry, you know, there's two, type of, two types of people in this world, those who think there's two types of people and those who don't. Thank you. Thank you.